Welcome to Dynamics Corner. This is Chris. And this is Brad. This episode was recorded on March 2nd, 2023. Chris, Chris, Chris. We're here back we again. are again <laughs> with, with another episode of In the Dynamics Corner Chair. As always, I look forward to these and I have a clue what I'm going to say. <laughs> so we have to start okay, 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 over. Cool. What was I going to say? I have no idea, man. I, I, I figured maybe you'd talk about... I had something good I wanted to say, and I should have written it down, but as you just told me, when yeah. you get old, you need you to write, write things down. down. And it's true. It's absolutely <laughs> true. So you could probably use this as the intro as part of it. That's why you had to write, write a book. As the preview to the intro. <laughs> That's why if you write enough, you're going to be able to write a book. <laughs> That's exactly what I should do. And... I don't know. Maybe you could use this as the intro and just bleep it out. Because with us today, <laughs> we had an amazing guest. And we were able to speak with him about his recent book release, Microsoft Dynamics 365 Business Central API Reference. Not only did we talk about the book release, we also talked about the use of APIs within Business Central. The conversation we had today was with Jeremy Visca. Here we go. Back at it. I always like to pause, make everybody have to sit in suspense for a minute. But uh, ready? Good. Here we go. Here we go. Jeremy, good day. Thank you for joining us. I've been looking forward hey, to welcome, speaking Jeremy. with you. welcome, Jeremy. Good to be here. been looking forward to speaking with you. Um, you know, partly in tune for, you know, all that you do and all you've done for the community. But more importantly... I was intrigued by your recent book release, uh, Microsoft Dynamics 365 Business Central API Reference, enabling a better understanding of the Business Central API. So I'm looking forward to speaking with you about Business Central APIs. There is a lot of conversation, you know, fluttering about with Business Central APIs. And when I saw that your book was released, I picked up a copy of it myself and I went through and I did find it very useful. Yeah, the day off it was released. I have it up actually right in front of me. <laughs> no, I <laughs> left it on the tab. I uh, do too. But before we start talking about Business Central uh, and the use of APIs within Business Central, and you know, more importantly to me, what I really would like to speak with you about is your your book authoring experience because I'm intrigued by that. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and some of your history and your experiences? Sure thing. And I just have to comment, just like when we were speaking the other day, you have the best background. The, the old classic <laughs> Navision 2.0 manuals yep, you know, have everything them. beat. I remember <laughs> having those in my cube oh, yeah. uh, you know, when I first started working with Business Center. I mean, with Navision at that point, gee. <laughs> I was lucky enough. I did not keep my originals one move 20 years back, and it made me very sad. And I was lucky enough to pick these up from somebody not too long back, and I was very happy to reacquire them. <laughs> I would love to get a set if somebody has one. Yeah, those things were like gold back right. in the day. I, I think you know you could compete with a couple of Microsoft uh, Business Central deals if they opened up a Nostalgia Division shop for yeah. us. Yeah. I think a lot of people in the industry would definitely still go for being able to pick up some of the stuff. Do you remember the keyboard strip that went above the function keys that had the layout? Mm -hmm. Wow, see, this is definitely a walk yep. down memory lane. But we'll keep going down memory lane. But if you could just tell us a little <laughs> bit about yourself, Jeremy. I know a lot of us know about you, but for those listening that may uh, not have encountered you, you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> sure thing. No problem. Uh, and, you know, my being in the space loudly is relatively new. Um, you know, it was a couple of years ago that uh, I started doing a lot more content creation and all that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, I got sass from somebody of, you know, I, I've never heard of you and now I can hear nothing but you. What just happened there? But um, yeah, I've been working with, you know, Navision at yeah, just showing my age because we were talking the old days, <laughs> working with Navision uh, <laughs> since version 2 something or other. I, I think 2.5 was the original one I was working with. So I, 
I'm, I'm with you on the, the long journey that we've all taken on that one. And at the time, uh, you, you'll appreciate this, I was in Massachusetts as well. So we may have once upon a time been in the same space going after some of the same wow. deals. Wow, <laughs> I did not know that you were in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I grew up uh, just outside of Boston. So. Interesting. We will have to talk about that. <laughs> Eastern. You know, I, I didn't, you know, that's one thing I did not know. I know that you moved from the United States over to Europe, but I did not know mm -hmm. that you were a Massachusetts native. I won't hold that against you. <laughs> yep. Because. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, you know that's, uh, you know, that's interesting. Interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I got my start way long time ago. I was originally an IT consulting kind of networking guy and uh, cross-trained right after Y2K, just to date the timing of things. Things calmed down, settled down. We were done patching all the servers. The world didn't explode. Uh, and, you know, the business slowed down. They said, well, cross-train me into doing this development stuff with your business system. So I cross-trained uh, at a small solution center in Westboro. Grafton, uh, something like that, uh, way long time ago. And then in the nature of our industry, if you're competent enough and brave enough to try things, then people will throw all sorts of things you are not ready for <laughs> at you. <laughs> and through that process, you eventually grow. Um, so I ended up doing eventually implementations. I got my MCT. I was doing uh, all sorts of like every role you can manage in the space. Um, you know, this technically is my third solution center. I've been some portion of operator owner of. Um, so it's been a heck of a long ride. Uh, one of the challenges I've always had is I like working with partners to help them with their customers. And the ecosystem is not always the friendliest to that because it's not a recognizable form of revenue from the big picture. So that can be a little bit tricky. But, you know, uh, somebody's got to keep the machinery moving sometimes, right? Oh, absolutely. That's, that's absolutely. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, always an interesting journey and things were different back then too. And I do remember the Y2K, we all thought we were going to go to sleep and, and wake up the next morning and, you know, the old song, Chaos. You know, we partying like it was 1999 because <laughs> uh, we thought it was going to end. But um, it, it's nice. Go ahead. And, uh, I was going to say, and then the, uh, the kind of the kickover was I found myself like many developers did. Uh, in that I was working with existing on-prem NAV customers all the way up until uh, 2019. I still hadn't gotten my hands onto VC. I, I still was stuck in the old modify the table, insert the code unit, you know, it, all of the old methodologies. Um, and I actually took a week or two off in summer of like 2019. I took a couple weeks off and I spent those time, I spent that time just live streaming, learning over as if I was starting over how to do development work with VC, um, just practicing and getting uh, the hang of it again. Um, and that ended up kicking off a lot of really interesting online relationships because a couple of people were like, what the heck is this? Someone's live streaming building what? <laughs> um, and uh, then it just kind of snowballed from there. I started speaking at conferences and um, that following spring, I ended up writing the first book of two. Uh, and that book I was in a hurry to produce. And so... Uh, 400 page plus uh, intro guide to Business Central uh, that we wrote and edited and got to release in less than 30 days. Wow. So you, um, you learned Business Central in 2019 via live streaming. It's a good way to learn, I believe. And then shortly mm -hmm. thereafter, you published your first book which I did wanted to talk about that as well, in less than 30 days or within 30 days. So that's from idea, yep. concept to publication within 30 days. That's amazing uh, with just learning yep. it. What did you, did you work and did you sleep? Did you eat during that time period or did you just <laughs> write a book? Um, I mean, you know, I, I uh, one of the quirks of being, because I am, 
publicly on the spectrum one of the superpowers or detriments, depending on how you can swing to apply it. Not everyone can. It's okay. Um, I, I definitely swing into a hyper focus mode of like, I need to do this thing and it obsessively becomes the thing I do. Uh, so I do try even when in that mode to make sure I'm eating, sleeping appropriately. I'm actually very careful and constructive on that. But outside of that, yeah, if I was like on the couch with my family and we were watching a movie, I was writing, <laughs> typing away on my laptop that whole time. Uh, so yeah, if, if I wasn't sleeping or actively doing something and prevented typing, no, I, was... <laughs> I, I understand completely the hyper-focus, uh, tendency to, to go through things. I, I do that quite a bit myself, but I could see how live streaming and, you know, putting yourself out there. Uh, a lot of people talk, you know, mm -hmm. well, deviating a little bit from the APIs, which we'll get to, but with the whole live streaming and blogging and speaking, mm -hmm. You know, someone once told me that's a good way to improve and learn because if you put yourself oh, out yeah. there, you're mm -hmm. forced to almost get better and you definitely yep. uh, get some feedback uh, from all different ends of the yeah. spectrum. Fortunately, in the business central community, for the most part, everybody's <laughs> rather supportive to, to help guide you to do mm -hmm. things in the right way or into the proper way. I mean, always there's more than one way to do things, but um, I myself have found, you know, getting yourself out there like you have done is a good way to, you know, understand and get the application it's a great, it's a great uh, community. knowledge in there. So uh, <laughs> to, to jump into, you know, the APIs and Business Central and, and uh, APIs, you know, I just wanted to kind of talk to you about your experience with uh, Business Central and APIs. Um, and we'll talk about what got you into the book, but API is a, a, an acronym that we hear quite a bit about, you know, and I figured someone that may be listening and then hears about this API, there's a lot of talk about business central APIs. Can you tell us what is an API? <laughs> yep, no problem. Uh, the very beginning of chapter one is what is the business central API and key terms you have to know. So it's absolutely the, uh, the key thing there. Uh, it stands for Application Programming Interface. Um, and it's just that is a general concept of being able to have two systems talk to each other with agreed upon set of rules. One of the other terms that gets thrown around is web services. And that is a different catch all term to let you know of how Business Central communicates with other web components. This includes the APIs, but it also includes some of the older tech uh, that you'll still find in use and some of the older customers and that sort of thing. You'll also find that people will talk about the APIs are RESTful, uh, which confuses people a little bit. Uh, that's just a agreed upon set of rules of I give you information structured like this, and you agree to give me a response structured like this. And one of the ways that RESTful uh, rules of communication, the actual content of that message is structured in different ways, such as OData. And the, uh, the APIs that we're working with for Business Central are an RESTful OData implementation of a web service API. That's a lot to <laughs> digest because... All of that are <laughs> terms that I hear with Business Central APIs, API, web communication in general. So I think you hit everything yep. in one sentence. So a Business Central API is a w restful web service that has OData. Wait, say that again. Can you, can you say that one more time? That <laughs> was beautiful. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I can't say it again. Yeah. Well, I, I, we'll rewind it and play um, it back. <laughs> no, that, no, that was go. perfect. That is perfect. <laughs> um, that clarified quite a bit because, uh, like I said, I hear people talk about this. Is it OData? Is it REST? Is it a web service? Is it an API? Yep. So with... Yeah, and a AJ and I, uh, you know, we, it was a team effort on writing it. A AJ, uh, who teaches classes in the API and has for years now, I took his class in API use and development years ago. Um, and uh, he and I worked pretty carefully on that section to have it make sense. And he gave some really good insights into trying to help dozens of people over the years understand what do all these different points mean and everything what are the terms so uh, that section is definitely a credit to his learning no it is it's a very informative section and i like the way the book 
was put together because to me, it was very basic. And I don't mean that in a derogatory manner. I mean that and it was very easy for me to go through and pick up. And I've worked with Business Central APIs for quite a bit. And I can honestly say that I picked up a new view and some insight into the Business Central APIs. I, I would say the same thing. And with the ease of use with it. Because I'm new, I'm new to API myself. Like in Business Central, I'm new to API. Like I just never worked on it before. And being able to follow through, I mean, just following this book, it's very easy to uh, to understand. So thank you for the book. <laughs> yeah. So to kind of speak to uh, what was the idea behind it and, you know, kind of who is it for and all those sort of fun things, um, I've uh, been asked to help people figure out the API or build custom ones and all that sort of thing. And my experience is that, Oftentimes, I'm playing a mediator broker role between users of the system who understand Business Central and the data that lives within it, the processes that live within Business Central, and third-party partners that are building you know, these web connectors that have never heard of or seen Business Central. And the, the challenge was is that I found a significant portion of the time I was spending in that mediator role was helping the two cross-talk between each other. So the reason that the bulk of this book is code sample screenshot is because it's representative of those two different sides of the table. And the goal out of those big bulky sections that was broken out endpoint by endpoint with screenshots all labeled was so that someone who's in finance can go, I can look at the customer card and go, these are the fields that I know I can connect to the web shop because they're labeled as this API point. And they can turn around and go to like a Magento or Shopify provider and go, I know you don't know Business Central, but here's the code. That's the field I need. And they can just point at and go this. That is great. Now I understand. I mean, I liked following and going through with it. And now you put the use case behind it. It, it paints a picture to why it's so basic right? Because it was so easy to put, you know, a lot of times people talk, well, you know, give me a mapping or what do I need? How do I, how does this go? But if you can see the data structure in the page together, it, it paints a nice picture. Uh, when working with APIs, so, the, so your target audience is for the business central users that need to work with an external source to communicate data between uh, business central and an external source, I'll, I'll call it for the conversation. Right. What is needed or an external source? What is needed yeah. to work with APIs in Business Central? Like how does somebody enable it? How does somebody access it? And then with that, maybe we can talk about what you can do through the APIs. So we know we can map information. What can we do with the information that we map? And I always pile on the questions. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Um, well, if you're on cloud, the APIs are just on. You're, you're good to go. It's part of living life in the cloud. You get a lot of benefits automatically enabled for you. Uh, if you're on-prem, you might have to do a little extra setup work on that. But um, by default, they try to turn themselves on. Um, so uh, the core understanding of what you can do with it is um, getting information in and out of the system. Um, and that could be trying to allow a web shop, for example, to create a customer, or you might be working with a power platform person, who is another example of the audience type that I'm thinking of when, when we built this, uh, you know, a power platform person that wants to help you build like uh, you know, a purchasing approval engine, and they want to create a purchase order document with an attached PDF out of Power Automate. Well, how do you go about those processes? So we structured the book kind of around the different parts of the system that you uh, can interact with. So for example, uh, part two is about financials, which is talking about all the ways that you can get information out of the system for financial presentation, uh, which is very valuable and useful if you're trying to build uh, Power BI dashboards off of these pieces of info. Um, the same is true for the sales and purchasing side of things, where you can get lots of info about customers and vendors and potentially do uh, dashboards of you know, business performance in that way. Uh, but purchasing and sales also exposes the ability to create, manipulate, and potentially take action on 
uh, standard sales and purchase documents. So, for example, maybe you are building a you know a B two B portal where a customer can log in to a power platform solution that someone built for you, and they can go in and see their balance as a customer or a vendor, and be able to get at I want the PDF of my invoice. Uh, I want to see that the payment was registered. These are all endpoints that you can make use of for that sort of thing as well as the inventory section, which lets you get some insight into what are some of the stock levels. So if you wanted to uh, have customers be able to potentially drill into and find out, you know, does this guy have this item? Or if you're working with a third party logistics company that you want uh, them to maintain stock information in your system about what's at their facility, you can access some of the item areas. Um, so those are the, a lot of the different like use cases that I could think of uh, across those different modules. Um, there is, a, I'll, I'll make mention of, there is also time registration entry for employees who are doing timesheets in Business Central, but um, I, I think there are, are some great solutions on AppSource that build against that API, so I'd rather encourage people to go use like uh, the Clockify apps and things oh, like excellent, that. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so a lot of those folks. external apps utilize the APIs. Which is great. So you yep. mentioned a couple points or a couple uses of the APIs within Business Central. Now you're you're mentioning it sounds with what you're referencing are the APIs that are available from with Business Central as part of the application themselves. What types of APIs are included? And you, you covered a lot of the areas. Like how many? Uh, you know, the question that people have. You know, I've worked on implementations and. What APIs are available, right? So they they come up with that blanket statement. What API are available? And then as part of that, you talked about creating sales orders, updating sales orders, reading inventory by location, and doing certain functions. What security do you have, and how do users go to authenticate it through an API to be able to limit the data? I've this was you know recently there's the big shift uh, you know in authentication services, and it's, it seems to be some some confusion about how to authenticate, uh, but how does that work? <laughs> uh, there were a few questions in there, so I'll take them in turn. Uh, there's about 70 or so main API endpoints built in, uh, and then um, I, th I think that's roughly about the number. It varies a little bit by release, um, so you'll have to check things. Uh, we did document the API v 2.0 which when we refer to that we're talking about the fact that business central um, has a lot of different api functionality especially in the cloud um, there are other apis that we did not cover in this because this is the api that has to deal with the business logic of business central the application itself there are some administrative api endpoints uh, that i would have loved to have covered but uh, we needed to get things out the door at some point. <laughs> we had been working on this one for a long time, and uh, with a major release every six months, uh, working on something for a long time can be challenging. Uh, there are some APIs around automation and cloud migration as well, uh, so you'll find some uh, occasionally references to some of those. Uh, but we focused entirely on the API that was more about working within the business, uh, within the business system, rather than on the business Understood. system. Yeah. Yes, it that does make good sense. But the concept of working with those APIs are the same. You, you didn't define them in the book, yep. but if you go through the book and you understand how to work with Business Central APIs conceptually, you should be able to pick those up as well. Yeah, absolutely. And to answer the authentication and how secure are these sort of questions, uh, if you're living in cloud, uh, the APIs are accessed via OAuth security. Um, and there is a whole pretty extensive chapter uh, that AJ put together that talks about you have to create some components in the Azure ecosystem to pre-approve what is accessible uh, via these APIs. Uh, there are some processes you have to do in Business Central to choose what permissions that the API logins can have access to. Uh, and then the way that OAuth works is you are authenticating using Microsoft's Azure ecosystem, so it's pretty robust, uh, and you get a temporary short-life token uh, that 
if you've looked through the book, uh, we showed like a sample of what that actually looks like. I, I kind of got some sass from my editors of you basically created just a page of letter <laughs> noise. What, what value is this? Um, but it's a, uh, it's a JSON token, which is a time sensitive, user specific, this is my authorization password that the business central system has given me that I have to, every time I talk to you, hand that back in. After a short period of time, that expires, and you need to say, here is my authentication information again. Can I have a new temporary pass? Okay. <laughs> so that token is valid for a certain period of time, so you can limit authentication within a limited period of time instead of just giving someone a username and password, for example, and having to uh, disable and see what they have. Yeah. As far as the filtering uh, of the data... Uh, uh, is within the API and with security, can you filter which subsets of data within Business Central, not from the API request? Because yeah, I have a quote from your book I want to mention after that. But <laughs> how do you filter sure, the I, data that a user I, can have access to? One of the things I should probably clarify too is in the authentication, there are multiple different scenarios whether a user is accessing data like via Power BI, real time or a web connector or whatever have you. And there's also service to service authentication. So there's some different methods, but they're all very similar in the concept of there's a whole handshaking process and a temporary uh, pass that is allowed for things. Um, when you create these app registrations in Azure, which is the term for the uh, server side, I agree that this login should have some permissions. You also have to create a user in Business Central for that app registration. And much like any user of the system, you can then control what permissions they have access to. And Microsoft, out of good caution and concern for the way that, you know, this is the APIs as a whole have this huge list of all the different areas of the system. You can get a customer list, vendor list, your financial statements, all of this giant massive amount of data. If uh, you're on cloud, you can't assign those app registrations super and just give them all permissions all at once great, and you're great. done. That's, that's not actually allowed. So you have to go through and actually opt into not only can the API user log in, but you have to choose explicitly what should they have the authority to. So access. that is a great security model because you know a lot of people just, ah just have super they have full access to the system. I think if you want if somebody's coming in externally, you know not only the, from the user yeah. directly from the application, but externally you want to make sure you can limit or control what they have. And um, another thing on that too is one of the things I like a lot is that Microsoft runs under the security model, generally speaking, of assume a breach will happen. What can you do? What? How do you know about it? All that sort of stuff. So one of the things that I was, uh, I wish I could have gone into great more detail in. I mention it, give a couple little brief highlights. Is telemetry is a really big deal that if you're also if you're using APIs. Uh, you want to enable telemetry for your environment. If you're on cloud, again, that's by pretty much, I think, default. But um, there is free stuff from Microsoft that you can open up a really robust dashboard right in Power BI's website that will pick up all of your environmental info. And you can do diagnostics to see, you know, here's the web traffic coming into and out of my system. So you can go, are, you know, I enabled the connector for the web shop team. I gave them all the info of how they connect to things. Let me go in the telemetry and look, did they actually try it yet? Because sometimes maybe they have oh, that's, it. That's nice. <laughs> telemetry is, a, I think, a whole, we could have a whole different discussion on telemetry, but it's yes. nice that you could use telemetry within Business Central to monitor the traffic, I'll say, or to see the activity going through your web services. With, with the use of APIs, are there any performance considerations that you, that somebody should have uh, in using of them? Um, I would say yes, but they're as optimized as they can be in a lot of clever and creative ways. Um, for example, some of the APIs are just producing uh, read-only data. Uh, many of them are marked throughout the books. Like if you're getting financial statements out of the system, those are effectively 
uh, data equivalent of reports that you're just slurping up data. One of the things I like that Microsoft did with the uh, APIs is that if they're read only, in cloud, they access the data from a real-time shadowed copy of your environment. So they're actually not impacting your production system. They're impacting and reading from a clone of it in real time. Interesting. That's, yes, um, that's very cool. interesting. So if you're building custom APIs as a developer for your end user, uh, you can control and say, hey, I want this API to be read-only, um, and I believe it's access intent. There's, you'll have to check me on the property. I don't recall off the top of my head. Uh, but there's a, a, a cue you can give to Business Central that says, hey, this is going to be read-only. Don't worry about doing write-only, and it'll pull from that copy. So it's super for performance on That's that. Great. That was one of the, the questions or concerns you know, that I, I've come across. And, and there was a statement that you made in your book, and I was thinking of this as I was going through it and thinking of this with APIs. And from your book, it was, and I read this sentence, and I wanted to talk to you about it as well. It's one area that confuses many people working with the Business Central APIs is the concept of navigation and expanding Right. And I just want to know if you could touch upon that and, you know, the navigation expanding. And I'll also include filtering because, you know, when you're looking at a sales order, for example, you know, you have the sales header, you have the sales lines, you know, how do we pull back a sales order or a subset of sales orders or navigate through them to find them? Yeah. Okay. So there's a bunch of cool. So you read my mind when uh, you were writing this book. I just want to let you know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Excellent. So the, the concept of navigation is just that the data is connected. So the sales line endpoint is connected to the sales header endpoint, effectively. I mean, there isn't specifically a sales header, it's sales order, sales order line, but the general idea applies. And so from the sales order, when you're looking at one specific record or even a list of records, you can do a command called expand and expand works on the navigation options. So from the sales order endpoint, you can expand the sales order lines. And what that does is it includes in the sales order response all of the fields of the uh, navigation element. So it gets a little confusing because expanding means expanding the navigation. Um, And one of the things that is important to remember with that, and this is good to know for performance, it is really easy to say, just give me uh, the sales order list and expand the sales order lines and not put filters on that. And you get this massive, massive data set. But oftentimes you need one or two fields from the header and maybe three fields from the line. One of the other things you can do to really get faster performance is you can use a little part of the URL when you request the URL. You can say specifically, I want these fields from the header and I want these fields from the line. And now your data set only includes those two header Uh. fields, those three subfields. And it can make the APIs run enormously faster. Um, It's probably one of the easiest games you can get. So limiting the fields that you use on top of what Microsoft has put into the architecture is a great way to increase the performance of it. And going through that section in the book, and that's why I'm, I'm happy and I wanted to bring it up to you, is one of the stumbling areas that I find when working with APIs or working with individuals trying to consume the APIs is how do I get this data? What do I do with this data? And I think, as I had mentioned in the book, you did a nice job with some examples. And it, it is, you did a great job explaining it, but I do have to say, I think it's easier to see an example, as you have referenced in your book, of <laughs> you know, the expanding in the fields. Because when I first worked with the APIs on the sales order, that expanding mm-hmm. thing was one of the first ones that kind of got me was, oh, yeah, I have to do the expanding and get the fields. So, yeah. Well, and the navigations are, if you've done development work, it's a lot like having the sub page functionality. Um, so, uh, but they're nested. So you can do navigations off of different endpoints. So you can navigate off of sales order, sales line, dimension set to get the dimensions for the lines. And if you want to do it all as one big batch call and say, you know, I need the sales orders for this customer with their item lines and on the item lines, I need to know what the department dimension was. You can do that multi-level navigation in one API call. As long as you do smart select to only get the fields you need, 
it's still oh, meaning that's quick. Great. Uh, if you just if you put those commands all together and don't limit your uh, field results, it can get to be a pretty beefy data set. I can however. imagine. So, I can imagine there's a lot about. of fields on those uh, records uh, within Business Central, you know, for the sales orders and the sales lines, and if you're adding the dimensions. Is there a way to page? You know, I, I ha- get that question quite a bit. You, if I need to pull items, you know, an entire item catalog, and I have 40,000 <laughs> items, you know, it's a large message to pull it through. How easy is it to page with the APIs? And, and you're making me look like a mind reader because on the tip of my tongue was a Oh, page. great. <laughs> see, we're on the, see it's, you're from um, the same area, so we're on the same wavelength. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, traditionally, whenever you're building like UIs and things like that off of data backends, you do client side paging, which means you get all the data and you give the client uh, UI that entire pile of data and give next back buttons that just change what you display. You could do that for business central APIs, but it's much more performant if you want to just get subsets of things. Um, One, you can apply your own filters to the data. So you can say, just give me only the items that have been updated since this date time, or more importantly with the paging, you can do server side paging and say, I want the first 500 results uh, from the item list. And what it will do is if you use that, uh, the paging functionality, um, in this case, uh, I think it's the top command that we would be talking about. Uh, I'll, I'll have to check my book. Um, <laughs> uh, if you're using uh, the uh, functionality around doing subsets of data, it will add on to the very end of your data set that you get. Um, it will hand you a new URL for when you want the next page of information. Okay, so you retrieve a page of number of records, mm-hmm. then as part of that message you yep. get back is a URL for the next set of records with you know for that range. So it's like that's a nice way of doing page one and page two. And I'm assuming on the second page yeah. you get a reference to the previous page which allows you to do like the front and back. And I'm going to cheat a okay. little bit here and go to oh. the book here. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you have permission to show this? I don't know if... Uh, I'll oh. ask the author. Right, great, I thank you. Right with it. But, um, <laughs> but the, uh, the way this is handled in the paging side of things, um, you can use top and skip to do client side paging like we talked about. Uh, but there's an HTTP header called prefer and you can instruct business central and what the maximum amount of results you want to have. Uh, and it will give you towards the end of the, uh, the OData result set that you're getting back from the API. It'll give you a little v- value called skip token. And what that is, is it's a URL that looks almost exactly the same as the get you just did, but it adds a little bookmark onto the end of it. The server hangs onto that as a basically here's where you left off in the data set. And so you do the next get on that skip token and you get your next page. And that way the server does all the paging work for you. uh, And it makes it very, very useful uh, to be optimized with that. So no, it does. That it does help. It helps yeah. clarify. And um, thank you for sharing a portion of uh, your book with me. It's a lot of information that we discussed and is in, in was in there. Now, what inspired you to write this book? I, I know you had mentioned you had done a book previously within thirty days. You know, what inspired you to write this book? Uh, because I kept getting confused by the APIs. <laughs> so, so it was out of necessity and you wanted to learn it. And then um, I, I was struggling uh, a great deal with trying to work with customer after customer that was doing what they should be doing. They're building Power BI's and web integrations against these APIs. And they were confused and looking to me for help. And I was going... This is confusing. I'm not sure I understand. Um, (laughs) So it was one of those things of if I'm going to spend all the time really researching it, really understanding it myself, why not write it down? I think it's a great idea because also if you have this question, chances are that somewhere in the world of, you know, 8 billion people, somebody else has the same question and and you can help them answer it. it. It could be small things like... Why is it called display name here and description here? Oh, 
okay, why is it called attachments here, but it's called incoming documents here? Boy, am I lost. Um, so I, I felt that a map of those sort of differences was valuable. And we actually had a discovery in the process of writing the book that was a, oh, geez, this book needs to exist in the world. Um, and that is the <laughs> the, the kind of scary truth, and I, I don't mean anything ill towards the Microsoft team, but version numbers are free. Um, I don't know why it's still API version 2.0. That was released uh, with BC 17. It is currently BC 22 is coming out in 30 days. Um, that means that there have been multiple major releases the challenge and concern that I have talked about in a few other places, but it was a big deal as I was researching on this book, is that the APIs, if they add information to an endpoint, they didn't consider that a breaking change, so there was no change to the version numbering. Now, if you're on cloud, that's a no big deal sort of problem. <laughs> but if you're not on cloud and you're working with customers that are across the ecosystem working on different versions, suddenly that potentially is a big, scary yeah, deal. That whole breaking change conversation you just gave me, like uh, Tourette, not Tourette's, or some nerve type issues because that <laughs> term breaking change is selective in my opinion. Uh, and like you had just stated, what what is the definition of a breaking change? But uh, yeah. And it's, it's uh, you know, if you're going back, uh, and I'm just going to jump into another section here. One of the things I was really proud of was this uh, chart that is included uh, to give a real quick insight into here are all the endpoints. Here's what you can do with the endpoints. Here's what page you can go to in BC, what page you can go to in the book to find out more about it. But most importantly, and this took some digging and sleuthing, we crawled through the history of BC to find out exactly what version each of the endpoints was added on. Not only that, but we covered the history of each of the endpoints. And there are endpoints that became that came into being even with minor updates. So like locations wasn't even with a major release. So if you're on BC 18 and you haven't updated for some reason, the cumulative update level, then you're in a situation where you might not have that location endpoint. And the documentation of the APIs doesn't reflect this because the API documentation reflects the current version. So if you're helping your on-prem customer trying to figure out what exactly has changed or uh, modified on a given endpoint is a real challenging sort of thing. So uh, one of the other areas that we jumped into uh, just to go through some of the uh, sections of hopefully I can find one off the top of my head. Yep, here we go. So uh, here's a customer uh, vendor payments endpoint. This was added not in 17, it was added to cumulative updates later, and then in version 18, they added a new navigation. How on earth, if you went to go back with a BC 17 customer, would you know what actually could you do with the API? So we took a long time to carefully crawl through things to find the answers to these questions of what changed every single endpoint, uh, if it was notable or not, um, which only was possible. And I'm just going to give a shout out because he deserves it. Uh, it was only possible because there is a lovely fellow on the internet who has a GitHub repository of all of the BC code throughout history. Um, and because he's been checking in the BC code uh, throughout the history of BC here, and he checks in every cumulative update and every build and all that sort of thing, we could use GitHub-based tools or Git-based tools to actually look at every individual endpoint and generate a difference version by version and review the history of what actually changed. That is endpoint. a very helpful site on GitHub. Um, and I think yes. a lot of people use it and uh, we'll put also put a reference to that in here because I think it is helpful. Now on top, you know, your first book took 30 days and now I understand why this book took a year because of all that information. Just the research on 
the versioning itself, I could see is something very time consuming. Helpful. Yes. Helpful. Thank you. I saw that that's in your book. Yes. One thing you showed some of your book and one of the questions that I had about the book, and I, I do want to talk about some of the tales of your book and what it was like writing this book, but what's the story behind the pins on the page numbers? Oh, uh, just my uh, <laughs> Is there a story behind the pins? Uh, simple. Um, a little bit. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm from Spare Brained Ideas, which is my little company. Um, and uh, the, the company name is sort of a fun one uh, because, um, first of all, it's riffing off of hair-brained okay. ideas. Um, so, you know, you're the type of mind who very quickly is jumping from neat new idea to neat new idea, which I'm guilty of for sure. <laughs> um, but also in bowling for those who are not aware of uh, hitting and successfully scoring a spare is often a difficult and challenging shot. So we, we multiplayed off of harebrained, off of the idea of having spare brain cells to rub together, and spares are also a difficult shot to take. I'm, I'm so it was I'm, kind of a multi I'm curious. Uh, when I saw that, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big bowler. <laughs> I was curious, do you bowl? <laughs> Not since I moved to Sweden. I have a little bit of a disagreement with how I generally find the lanes being maintained. Apparently, I didn't know this, but I was a lane snob, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, once upon a time, I've worked in a bowling alley. And, uh, so, you know, I understand the maintenance level that goes into really grooming the lanes yes. correctly. And uh, that that isn't well understood. So, so they have oh, all man. the chipped lanes, <laughs> uh, you know, like from the people just tossing it's just the, the oil. I, en I enjoy him. bowling myself. <laughs> I prefer the the yeah. ten pin or the duck pin versus candle pin. I try candle pin every now and then, but you know, <laughs> some of us call them big balls, little balls, but uh, it's the candle pin and the, the, the ten pin. So, and um, to, to also just mention uh, the other fun sort of side thing is you know, uh, and and those of you who are indie like self side project side hustle kind of people you'll probably understand and appreciate this you ever have domains that are just sitting around from past projects and you decide you know this is already all set up i can make use of this uh spare brain ideas actually was originally my son and i were making little games together in the roblox ecosystem and spare brain ideas was the name of our little gaming uh, studio that we built so together. fun story the so the logo <laughs> and then the history of the name and absolutely if i told you how many domain names I have purchased over the years and how many I've <laughs> held on to, you'd laugh at me. I mean, I went through phases and I'm like, oh, I'll do something cool with this. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> they they come through to something and, and oftentimes they just expire and somebody else can pick them up. Uh, Which, you know, it also leads to, and I'll, I'll make mention of this, because that was the origin of it, our logo elements uh, is actually from a game icon free library site. Oh, that's so <laughs> cool. <laughs> so it's actually a uh, remix from a game icon site. So if you're just a hobbyist building game icons and you're looking for, you know, creative commons free ones to use by attribution, mm -hmm. here's officially my attribution. See, and you see, you <laughs> don't have so to pay cool. all this money for someone to do a fan Fancy graphic. You can go to the free free library, or you know, even sometimes what is open it, source image. Fiverr. How do you say it? F I V R R. You can find someone to do something for you for a few dollars too, uh, instead of spending all of this money. So, what was it like writing the book over the years? So, your first book you did in thirty days, and you didn't eat, sleep, and you did nothing but carry your computer with you. What was it like for this one? And I can. <laughs> Definitely see more of a challenge now that you went through and explained the versioning because not only did you have to keep current with, as you were writing the book, keep current with the releases of the major wave updates, but also the interim cumulative updates. What was your life like while you were writing this book? Um, so there are three authors on this book. AJ lent a lot of his wisdom uh, to a lot of the explainers. Like, for example, the authentication chapter is a doozy. That That's all him. Um, the third author on this, Philip, is a co-worker of mine, uh, co-owner of mine here at Sparebrained Ideas. And that poor man, 
I taught him early on how to document the, uh, how to set up the APIs in Postman. Uh, we reviewed all the things he needed to do just about a year ago. Um, and then I pointed him at the Word doc. I gave him the Excel list of here's everything you need to go through. Here's all the legwork you need to do. Uh, every few months I would turn to him and say, guess what you get to do all over again? <laughs> he must really appreciate you, one, because you said the D word, which, you know, doesn't really exist as, uh, in the, the, the system. Uh, and two, to have to do it over and over again. I can understand why he has a little animosity towards you. He, 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 earned the, he, he earned the name on the cover with the number of times that he had to redo the code samples carefully over and over again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the the longer we took to complete it, the longer the release cycle was and the more there were challenges around it. So uh, this was definitely in the category of we, we needed to get this out and done, but he knows full well, too, that I'm going to poke him in about a month, month and a half to go, guess what we get to do again? Because uh, there's a new major release. In the yes. Region. But hopefully now we have the wherewithal that now that we understand how to mine the history, we should be able to just do a mine to go, okay, there are only five endpoints that change. We only need to redo five chapters. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> so the, when you went through this book, I recall when it first came out, just a funny story, and I am saddened that I wasn't able to pick up the copy. I picked up uh, I saw that it was released. I saw that you announced it. I ordered a PDF. And then shortly after I ordered the, the book, I saw a note from you saying that some people were lucky enough to get in what I will call an editor's <laughs> copy of the PDF. Tell me a little bit about that story. And I will say that I'm saddened that I didn't get a copy. Hint, hint. <laughs> okay. So uh, with both books, they were written in Word. Um, you know, whether that's a good idea or not is uh, open to debate, and I won't be doing it for the next book for sure. Um, but there is benefit to it because Word does have a lot of functionality around uh, tracking changes uh, and being able to do comments by the different people who have access to it. So you can keep track of the changes to the document over time. Uh, for those of you who haven't used the review functionality of Word. Um, what ended up happening is uh, fairly last minute before I was going to hit the launch button to say it's officially live and for sale, um, I needed to check one last, did the, you know, the editor had added one note that morning. And I went, oh, okay, let me go look at it. Left my review settings on when I exported a PDF. So the first two people who got the PDF, and, and that, that's a bit of advice for you, uh, always open the PDF that you're about to upload. <laughs> to I, yes, site. I can see that. Um, so there were a, a small handful of people that acted so quick uh, that they got a copy of the PDF uh, and all, you know, it's nothing salacious, um, but there were sections where, you know, it was read with like crossed out lines and then replaced with other text. And along the right hand side, there would be some of the editor's comments. Um, so yeah, I, I did get some a notification from a friend who bought it immediately. Um, and he's sassed me a couple of times if he's going to get it specially printed and make me sign. I would absolutely do that. And it's also a note, not only do you check it before you export it to PDF, but don't do like I do and write creative fun comments because they could be leaked. <laughs> <laughs> That is definitely uh, something I encourage people to be careful with. You never know what metadata is going to escape. Thankfully, I think the most salacious comment we had in that entire book, because I adhere to that principle, was uh, like there was a missing verb in a sentence somewhere, and the editors asked me, of, what exactly are we going to do here? Uh, uh, we're going to party. <laughs> No, admit. So it was very tame from that standards. All of the swearing. Was oh, offline. good. I'm sure that you heard that when you're making, you know, your poor friend do the documentation over and over <laughs> again. He yells through the wall. What is it like yeah. publishing 
are going through a book. I mean, this book, a lot of the books that are in the Business Central community, you know, I see a lot of, you know, similarities with how they're published and and who publishes them. Mm-hmm. Your book you did differently than most, not all, but most of the books. And so what was it like going through the experience of publishing the book? Well, uh, let's see. The very first one I published uh, almost coming up on almost two years ago. And originally uh, that was uh, for sale on Gumroad. Um, this is a little bit of, uh, you know, sort of behind the scenes of the logic of why use what platforms. Um, when you're selling services and time, you don't have to think as much about VAT, sales tax, uh, GST, all the various tax structures around the world that apply to goods don't apply the same way to services. And so services is a lot easier to figure out for many people in our industry. We do this all the time. It's much easier to solve. Products don't fall under that rule. And while I've occasionally heard people be a little blasé of they have to catch me first, I don't like that rule uh, to my tax approach in life. Uh, <laughs> that is not a good way to go. Um, so I wanted to have some sort of solution that would handle the VAT throughout Europe, that would handle sales tax in the U.S., uh, GST uh, in Canada and Australia. I don't know. It, lots of different places around the world. Different tax structures apply when someone buys a deliverable thing, uh, even if it's a PDF file accounts. So when I was looking around, I follow a lot of indie makers, people who build their own stuff. Gumroad was a good system at the time for what I needed it to be, which is customer um, facing sales front. They handle all the checkout stuff for me. And most importantly, they are able under tax laws that went into place over the past few years. They act as my tax agent of record. And they basically go, you give us your VAT number. So I'm in Europe. You give us your VAT number will register all of the taxes on the purchases and sent and disperse the amounts and do the reporting on your behalf to the appropriate government agencies. So it's literally just someone gives a credit card to Gumroad, Gumroad goes, here's a PDF. And at the end of the month, Gumroad turns to me and goes, here's your post-tax money. Nice. That's whatever they charge you for that. That's a great convenience fee because if you were to try to keep up with all the tax rules I know in the United States, each state has many different rules. You know, a PDF would be taxed differently in some states than a tangible book. So the headache that you would have for that isn't worth it, in my opinion. So I think that's a good choice. Um, Yep. These days I'm on a similar system. I have moved over to a different company uh, called Lemon Squeezy, Uh, you know, as in easy easy peasy. peasy, Lemon Squeezy. Like it, like it. Yep. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with them. I moved uh, just about a month and a half ago. I wanted to be on the new ecosystem when we launched a new book. The other thing is that with the first book, uh, I just sold it as a PDF. And with that, the platform takes their cut and the rest of the revenue is yours. Um, very straightforward, but you know, lots of people are, and myself included, are a big fan of being able to turn on a shelf and go, okay, what's What's the yeah. So I took the advice of uh, Eric Hugard, um, who publishes the user field guide uh, to Business Central, one of the other uh, user-oriented books in the market space. He was like, you got, you got to get a print copy together, man. Get on Amazon. Just get it done. Like, uh, I, I kind of hemmed and hawed. I tried out a couple of other printing alternatives uh, in Europe that I thought might do the job because sales on business central books are never they're they're not the primary reason to do things so you don't want to go turning around to a print shop and say give me 500 copies because this is going to sell like bangers no so you want to have a good print on demand service to work with and eric wisely was like just get on amazon kdp get it done get the global distribution done They'll charge you whatever they charge you, and then they'll send a disbursement at the end of the month, and same sort of sitch. They take care of everything else for you. You're just done. Okay. So a few months later, I finally went through the process of getting it set up on Amazon and went through that process. And, you know, it's it's done reasonably well. I think the um, it, one of the cautionary tales is never expect the time to be worth it. 
Um, you know, I put, even though it was an intense short period of time on book one, um, it'll be several more years of sales before it recoups if I were to just do billable hours that were the equivalent of it. It's not a financially viable strategy to pursue from a time perspective. Um, and that's uh, been the experience I've heard from other people in the industry as well, that, you know, it's a small industry. We're not going to do 10,000 print runs like a nice mystery novel or whatever have you. Um, so you have to be producing the book because it's something you want to do. Um, and you're going to have to view it from the perspective of it's an investment into accomplishing something you want to accomplish. Maybe eventually it might pay for the time, but uh, I think Eric has his book stats available online. I think after several years, he's at five or 600 copies sold. So it's not a huge volume industry. No, it's, it's, a, it's a small community that's getting larger through the use of the, the product. But I could see, you know, I, I agree. I mean, sometimes you just have to do things because you have the personal interest and the personal value. And, you know, if it is profitable in a sense, you know, define profit, you know, if you feel good, is that profitable? Mm. If you're talking financially profitable, right. if you give, have passion, you know, maybe eventually, you know, that will pan out, but at least to say they did. I'm envious of everyone who, you know, as I was talking with you the other day, I'm envious of everyone who creates a book and, you know, I, I'm even considered, maybe I'll just draw like a character stick figure book of, <laughs> you know, things. Hey, and publish it's, it it's just it. like this podcast, right? We do it out of passion and love to the, for the community. No, that's, well, that's absolutely why we do this podcast. I mean, this podcast yes. is just to, you know, get to communicate with members of the community and, you know, put information out with others. So I think that's great. <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you for sharing that with us. W what else, uh, anything big, new, and exciting that you want to talk with us about today? Well, um, uh, because it is a popular question, um, it uh. <laughs> does exist as an object now. Nice. Look at that, a print copy of the book. I have to order that. <laughs> So that is officially, as of yesterday, uh, now available. Uh, I was hurrying Amazon along because the process can take a few days before they get you your proof copy. And I wanted to make absolutely sure it was everything we wanted it to be before I said anywhere that it was a public thing. But this way, you know, I wanted people to be able to sit down at a table and go, here's the API, here's the page. This is what I mean. Can that you build is great. It? That's so cool. Can you hold that up again? I want to see the, <laughs> the, the cover again. <laughs> sure. So it's, and I love all the screenshots with it, too. No, so you're going to be able to just kind of flip through, which is awesome. Absolutely. So it's Microsoft Dynamics 365 Business Central API reference, enabling a better understanding yeah. of the Business Central API, which it truly does. And I'm not just saying that because I did purchase the PDF and I did go through it. And now it's available on print or in print via Amazon, I'm assuming, because of the conversation. Yep. I, and, you know, it's one of those easy things, too, of just sparebrain.com slash books will drop you right to all of the various... Sparebrain.com slash books. And then also to get in touch yeah. with you... Uh, we do have a link that we'll post in the show notes that goes to your website. It's also on your website. You have a link that has all of the ways of getting in touch with you, which um, if you want to share that, we'll also yep. post that. Um, so, uh, you know, and if you're thinking about writing a book uh, and, you know, think a little bit too about your expectations in relation to the audience size. Um, for example, I didn't expect uh, your first 20 hours to do very well. The reason for that is it's a really good getting started book. And I love so much that if you search for Business Central for Dummies, it now comes up. Uh, even though that's a trademarked title and not the title of the book, mm. it still comes up. So, um, <laughs> But you have to not know Business Central and how to use it but no business central exists and want to know how to use it. And that's a really yes, narrow see slice that. of people in time. Um, what I do hope out of that one 
I made the entire first chapter of your first 20 hours available. It's like 40 pages. It's just a free PDF. You can just grab free copies of it. And it explains all the basics of these are the different types of pages. This is what I mean by a fact box. And all the you know different modules that are in the system, the things that we have to explain over and over again that I don't I don't like explaining it over and over again. We've been doing this for you know at, between the three of us at least like fifty years. We've been doing this now. Like that's a lot of times to be explaining what's a post. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think. Every time I think of how long I've been doing, 1999. You need you, Jeremy. You need to put the. You need to turn that into like a pocket book or something, like a printable pocket book. <laughs> Well, don't give me any ideas. I was just about to talk to him. We should let's let's do one like your third sixty hours with Business Central or something, so we can try to broaden the market to be, you know, not someone who's using it today. But let's go through some advanced features, such as well, I have some things I was going to write about, no. so I'm not going to give them away on here. <laughs> yeah, it, it would have to get in line. I've already got books three and four in the pipeline. Can you tell oh, us what cool. those will be about, or do we have to wait? Um, well, I am thinking about taking a swing at the, a junior developer guidebook uh, for someone who is just starting out. There are already great resources on the market space uh, for that. Um, like uh, Brummel, uh, she has the fantastic sixth edition now of programming with Business Central. Uh, still one of the best books out there. Um, but I tell people this all the time with blogging. It doesn't matter if someone else has already covered that topic. You're telling your version of that topic. And what makes sense to one set of people, you are going to make sense to a different overlapping set of people. So tell your story. Tell it your way. It, even if the person that's receiving this has to hear it from three different sources to have that aha moment, well, great. Mm -hmm. Good. Tell, no, tell I agree it. with you. It's oh, wow. it's it goes with what we had mentioned before. Is you just put yourself out there. You have to talk about it because you'll never be the only one. You'll never be just the one. But right. if you get your story out there, it's your story, and you can feel good. And it also reinforces that you know it. The Directions North America conference is coming up in April. Will you be attending that? I know you're coming over from overseas. I didn't know if you were coming. Um, I had to be, because we are a small and overly busy practice, uh, I did have to be a little judicious with which conferences I picked. So I said, okay, in this year, what are my top three? Um, so for me, uh, there were a couple conferences that I wanted to go to that just didn't make the difficult top three cut uh, selection. Um, so I'm mostly sticking to Europe this calendar year, just partly because of I travel understood. budget and that sort of thing. Um, so my lineup this year is I'm going to be in Slovenia with Dynamic Minds in May. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm, I'm for the very first time I'm bringing my family along uh, to enjoy the very scenery fun. and see the conference experience. Uh, so that's a new thing. Um, and my son, I'm looking forward to him having the experience of, you know, kind of seeing what the ecosystem is like. He's 15 and, uh, he was the one who made me the, oh, great. Pixel, no, it's, right? it's pixel nice that you, I noticed that behind you too, you have a pixel It's art. nice that you have him involved <laughs> in all of that. I, I was asking because, well, I, yes. you know, we'll talk about your other conferences, you know, are you, I'm, sure. are you going to EMEA? That's the one I really want to hit. I've never been, but I made it a goal and because it's a goal, I will be there unless for some physical reason I can't. I mean, I have to say that it's, you know, <laughs> I'm going to attend unless, you know, physically I'm unable to attend. But I was asking about directions because the if other... I pick up a book, I wanted an autographed copy. So I take it with me yeah. and I sign it. So now I have to wait until, what other two conferences are you attending? Yeah, I'm going to do BC Tech Days in June. Um, and I'm a big fan of that. It does developer deep dives, so it's very dev oriented. And then I will be doing directions in Mia uh, in November in yeah. France this year. Um, and that's at the very beginning of November. So uh, directions in Mia, that's it, it can be an overwhelming experience with north of 3,000 people. Uh, there's a lot to go on there, and it's it's one of the bigger ones. So my favorite so far in the past has been BC Tech Days as an attendee and as a speaker, uh, but BC EMEA is in a it's, league of its own. 
So we'll see how much fun Dynamics Minds is because that's yes. a new one. Well, there's, this is, yeah. yes, that's one I've seen quite a bit about. The BC Tech Days is interesting in the directions of me as everyone talks about it. It's like the, the, the big, you know, yeah. the big mecca, I guess you could call it because you have all, you know, you have the numbers, but it's all partner or, you know, partner related, mm -hmm. whereas... You know, over in the U.S., we have Community Summit, for example, which is a large conference, but that's mainly geared towards customers where you can have thousands and thousands of users. Mm -hmm. But to have 3,000 business central professionals, you know, Rock implementing stars. the product, yeah. it's uh, it's great. So, well, hopefully, I don't think I'll do the Dynamics Mind. BC Tech Days, I'm not certain of, but EMEA, like I said, so I'll have to have a copy of uh, the, the book by then <laughs> to, to take with me in my bag and have you sign it. Well, you know, there, there are U.S. conferences I wish I were going to. I know uh, Dynamics Con Live is coming up as well. I think that's just later mm -hmm. this month, if yeah. I recall the timing on that. Um, there's Directions NA is going on, and there is, like you said, Summit, I think. Is yes, one of the other that's in October. Yes. That's a big one. Directions so, NA will be in April, mid-April. So. Yeah. So... Uh, lots of bits and pieces going on, but sadly, uh, no, no, no I, I understand airfare <laughs> and travel in the U S just, uh, you know, within the continent has gotten quite expensive uh, as well for some reason. So I appreciate yeah. it. Well, Jeremy, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. I am, I learned a lot about you. Uh, I enjoyed hearing more about your book, what went behind the book, and you know, just the general conversation. And again, the book is Microsoft Dynamics 365 Business Central API Reference, Enabling a Better Understanding of the Business Central API. I, I will thank you, Philip, and AJ for putting that together. I know that there's three of you on the cover. I, I think, and I'm saying it with all sincerity, I think it's a great book. It's a great guide because the way that you put it together it puts it all right in front of you without having to figure it out. And that piece with the history is invaluable for different versions until they decide to say, okay, well, now we'll do version three, version four, version five, <laughs> or even version 2.1. Yeah. If it came out in version 2.1. Yeah. But um, <laughs> right. Pick it thank up. you again, this Jeremy. Is, this is a great reference book. Thank you, Chris for your time for another episode of In the Dynamics Corner Chair. And thank you to our guests for participating. Thank you, Brad, for your time. It is a wonderful episode of Dynamics Corner Chair. I would also like to thank our guests for jo joining us. Thank you for all of our listeners tuning in as well. You can find Brad at developerlife.com. That is D-V-L-P-R-L-I-F-E.com. And you can interact with them via Twitter, D-V-L-P-R-L-I-F-E. You can also find me at matalino.io, M-A-T-A-L-I-N-O dot I-O. And my Twitter handle is matalino16. And see, you can see those links down below in the show notes. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you and take care. <laughs>